Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Arthur Seward. I am here tonight to bear witness to the truth of certain events, which you may find hard to believe, but I ask that you do believe them. I have certain documents, telegrams, clippings from the press of the day, memoranda, and letters in various hands. All needless matters have been eliminated. So the history, almost at variance with the possibilities of contemporary belief, may stand forth as simple fact. I present you first with excerpts from the private journal of Jonathan Harker. I, Jonathan Harker, Loyal's clerk, articles to Peter Hawkins, Esquire of Exeter, England, am writing this journal in the hopes that if misfortune overtakes me, it may one day come to the eyes of those who love me. I set out from London on the last day of April to visit one of our clients in Eastern Europe. On May the 3rd, I arrived in Budapest and came after nightfall to Klassenburg, on the border of Transylvania. At Bistritz, there was a letter of welcome for me from our client, informing me that his carriage would wait me at the Bogo Pass. It was signed, Dracula. Bukovina, coach for Bukovina. The road was rough, but still we seemed to fly over it with feverish haste. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement among the passengers. They kept speaking to the driver and, and looking at me and urged him on with the greatest speed. The crazy coach rocks from its great leathery springs. The mountains seem to come nearer to us on either side. Uh, coachman! Uh, coachman! Wh what is it? Where are we? You are nearing your destination, young heir. This is the Borgo Pass. There were black, rolling clouds overhead. And in the air, the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. Now we were through the pass. The young heir is not expected after all! You... Are early tonight, my friends. The coach, with four horses, had drawn up beside us. Let me help you, sir. The coachman smiled, and the lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with berry red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. We began to move. I, I looked back. The coach and its load of passengers had vanished from sight. We swept into the darkness of the pass. I struck a match. It was within a few minutes of midnight. Then a dog began to howl somewhere far down the road. The wind was rising, moaning and whistling through the rocks, and the branches of the trees crashed together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and fine, powdery snow began to fall. The bang of wolves sounded nearer and, and nearer, as though... as though they were closing around on us from every side. We kept on ascending, always ascending. The howling of wolves was growing less. Presently, it, it ceased altogether, and... just then, the moon broke through the black clouds, and by its light, I... I saw around us a ring of wolves running alongside the carriage in silence, with white teeth and lolling red tongues and very long sinewy limbs and shaggy hair. Welcome to my house. I must have fallen asleep. The carriage had pulled up into the courtyard of a vast, ruined castle. The coachman was nowhere to be seen. Welcome to my house. Come freely. Go safely and leave something of the happiness that you bring. Uh, C Count Dracula? I am Dracula. The face was strong, very strong, aquiline. The mouth, so far as I could see under the heavy mustache, was fixed and, and rather cruel looking with peculiar sharp white teeth. Hmm. You hear them, Mr. Harker? The wolves? The children of the night. What music they make. As you say, Mr. Harker, the wolves. Listen. Mm. 
Come now, there are many things you must tell me tomorrow. Of England and of the estate there you have purchased for me. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. The estate is called Carfax, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, that's so. But now I will detain you no longer. You will find your room in readiness, and I advise you not leave it during the night. This castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. I explored. There are doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all of them locked. The door to the great hall, the door to the courtyard, every door in the castle's closed, bolted against me. Castle... Castle Dracula's a prison. And I am a prisoner. The next night, I, I could not sleep. So after a few hours, I got up and... Uh, lighting my candle, I placed my shaving mirror on the dressing table and was just beginning to shave. You seem... Restless, Mr. Harker. I had not seen him. Although the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me, I I turned to the glass again. Count Dracula was, was close to me. I, I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. It was blank. I, I started and, and, and cut myself from the side of the throat. So the blood was trickling down my neck. <sighs> Count, my mirror. The blood. The blood. Wipe the blood from your face, Mr. Harker. Take care how you cut yourself. It's more dangerous than you think in this country. When I awoke, I, I found that most of my things were, were gone. My passport, my, my notes, my letter of credit... I could find no trace of them anywhere, and my door was locked from the outside. June 20th. There's some kind of work going on in the castle. Now and then I hear the faint away muffled sound of Mattock and Spade. And last night, the second of three dated letters which Dracula made me write, the second of that series which was to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth went forth. Count Dracula. Yes, my young friend. Uh, well, what of me? When am I free? When can I leave this place? Free? Mr. Harker, you are always free. You want to leave? You would like to leave tonight? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, in God's name. My dear young friend, not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will. Come. Follow me. Hmm. Your door seems to be bolted. How strange. Your door is locked. Well, in God's name, open it! As you will, Mr. Harker. You're, you English have a proverb which is very close to my heart. Welcome the coming. Speed the departing guest. Good night, Mr. Harker. Shut the door! Shut the door, I tell you! Shut the door! Shut it! The door is shut, Mr. Harker. I take it you will remain. Morning, June the 30th. These may be the very last words I write in this diary. Oh, God, preserve my sanity. I... I've never seen Count Dracula by day. At sunrise, at the first cock crow, he's gone. I don't understand these things. I only know that wolves are baying and that he is a man with hair on the palms of his hands, with sharp teeth and no blood in his face. He casts no shadow. He cannot be seen in glass, and he moves like a bat across the sheer face of the castle walls. He eats no food, and is mortally afraid of the crucifix. As I write this, I, I hear in the courtyard the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. 
And there is, in the passageway below, a, a pound of heavy boxes being set down. Boxes shaped like coffins. And I know what they hold. The boxes are filled with holy earth from the chapel beneath the castle. It is the last box being nailed down. And now I, I hear the heavy feet tramping again. The door is shut and the, and the chains rattle in the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the cracks of whips. Help! 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 The wagons have gone. I, I'm alone in the castle. I'm alone in the castle. I'm alone in the castle! I'm alone! I'm alone! Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Seward. Mr. Harker's journal terminates at this point. I now present in evidence a clipping dated August of that year from the Yorkshire Telegraph from our correspondent in Whitby. One of the greatest and sudden of storms on record was experienced here today. The weather's been somewhat sultry, but Saturday evening was fine. The band was playing, the piers were crowded with holidaymakers. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and there was a dead calm. But there were a few lights at sea. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner under full canvas that was seemingly going westward. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. And there, with all sail set, was the foreign schooner rushing with terrific speed toward the shore. A searchlight was turned on her, and there lashed to the helm was a corpse with dripping head which swayed horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. A moment later, she crashed, and then a strange thing was seen. At the very instant she touched, a huge dog sprang up on deck from below, and running forward, jumped from the bow onto the sand and, making straight up the east cliff toward the graveyard, vanished into the night. The coast guard, going abroad at dawn, found the dead man fastened to a spoke of the wheel. Tightly clutched in one hand was a crucifix. The man must have been dead for quite two days. In the pocket of the dead man's coat was found a bottle, carefully corked, containing a roll of paper. This proved to be an addendum to the ship's log. There was found on board only a small amount of cargo, and that of a most unusual nature. Apparently, the ship carried nothing but earth, common earth, packed away in wooden boxes, shaped much like coffins. Log of the Demeter, a Russian flag, Black Sea to Whitby, July 6th, finished taking in cargo, a queer cargo, boxes of earth. At noon set sail, east wind, fresh, crew, four hands, Two mates, Cook and myself, Captain. July 11th. Entered Bosporus at dark. Passed through the Dardanelles. Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Boyardin, was missing. Took starboard watch. Eight bells last night. He was relieved by Taliesin, uh, who never came uh, to his bunk. There's something aboard this ship. <laughs> no. Don't laugh, Captain. In the rain last night. Oh? A tall, thin man. Go up the companionway, along the deck, forward, and disappear. And I go to the bow, no one. And the hatchways were all closed. July 22nd. Rough weather, last three days. All hands busy with sails. No time to be frightened. Past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well. July 24th, last night, another hand was lost, disappeared. Like Talisian, he came off his watch at midnight. We never see him again. You want double watch now? I don't take watch alone no more. Nor will I. No more. Double watch. July 29th, had single watch tonight. As crew too tired to double. When morning come... Hey! Hey, below! Balocky! Balocky! Hey, Balocky below! Balocky, come! Balocky's gone like the others! 
like all the others. The mate and I have agreed to go armed henceforth. July 30th, last night. We are nearing England, fine weather, all sail set. Captain! Captain! The, the men on watch are missing, more missing! Now, only self and mate, and one hand left to work the ship. August 3rd, two days of fog and not a sail sighted. At midnight I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it, I found no one there. It's here! I know it now, I saw it! Like a... a man! Tall and thin and ghastly pale! It was in the... the bows, looking... looking out! I, I gave it the knife! But the knife went right through! Empty as air! What? What is it? What are you talking about? It's here! And I'll find it! It's in the hold! It's one of those boxes of earth! I'll unscrew them one by one and see! And I'll see! He's mad! Stark raving mad! It's no use my trying to stop him! He can't hurt those big boxes! They are in voiced as common earth! Ah! He's there! Down, down in the hold! I know the secret now! The sea shall save me from him! That's all that's left! That's all that's left! August 4th. I am all alone on my ship, and still the fog. I dared not go below, I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed, and in the dimness of the night I saw it. I saw him. God forgive me. But the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a sailor in the blue water. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which I dare not touch, my crucifix. I am growing weaker, and the night is coming on. God and the Blessed Virgin. Help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Telegram, Seward, Per Fleet to Van Helsing, Amsterdam. Lucy Westenra in alarming condition. Cannot diagnose. Come at once, Seward. Telegram, Van Helsing. Amsterdam to Seward, Per Fleet. I am on my way to you. Please arrange for me to examine your patient immediately. My arrival, Van Helsing. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall now explain that six months before the events recorded here, I had become engaged to a young lady, Lucy Westenra. We were to be married in the spring. My old teacher, Professor Van Helsing, arrived at four in the next afternoon. I took him at once to Lucy's house. She lay in her bed, asleep. She was ghastly, chalky pale. The redhead seemed to have gone even from her lips and gums, and the bones of her face stood out. Young miss is bad, very bad. She must have blood or she will die. Yet she is not anemic. The qualitative analysis of her blood is quite a normal condition. It is strange. I do not like to think how strange. Look! My God, her throat, look! The black velvet band that she always wore had dragged up a little and showed a red mark on her throat. Just over the external jugular vein were two punctures, not large, but not wholesome looking. The edges were white and worn looking. Well? What is it, Professor? What's wrong with her? Speak frankly. You can tell me the worst. I wish I could, Seward. I wish I could. But I do not dare. But won't you tell me anything? I will tell you this. Your young lady is in danger greater than death. You must believe me. If you leave her for one moment and harm befalls, you will not sleep easy thereafter. September 8th. I sat up all night with Lucy. Arthur, I'm afraid. 
My dear, you, you can sleep tonight. I'm here watching you. Nothing can happen. And I promise at any sign of bad dreams, if I see anything, I'll wake you at once. Uh, you will? Will you really? Then I'll sleep. I sat all night by her bedside. She did not wake once during the night, although the bows or a bat or something flapped almost angrily against the window pane. September 11th, still quoting from my private journals. At this time, I received a message from Perfleet. It read, 10.20 p.m., St. John's Hospital. Serious complications, case 891. Your immediate presence in London imperative. I had no choice. Sometime later, a paper was found among Lucy Westenra's belongings. I write this and leave it to be seen that no one by any chance may get into trouble through me. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the window was closed as Dr. Van Helsing had directed. About two in the morning, I awakened. I went to the door, called out, Arthur, Arthur. There was no answer. Something's broken the window. I'm in the room alone. I dare not go out. The house seems to be empty. The air is full of specks floating, circling in the draft from the window. And the light burns blue, dim. What am I to do? Something very sweet and very bitter all around me, like I'm sinking into deep water. And there's singing in my ears. Who shall be flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood? Oh. September 12th, late. Only resolution and habit can let me make an entry tonight. We found her sprawled on the floor, and there was a draught in the room from the broken window. The throat was bare, showing the two wounds looking horribly white and mangled. We are too late, my friend. We have failed. God's will be done. She is dying? Yes, she is dying. Stay beside her. It will make much difference, mark me, whether she dies conscious or in her sleep. It was late in the afternoon before she opened her eyes. Arthur? Oh, my love, I'm so glad you've come. I took her hand and knelt beside her. Her breath came and went like a tired, peaceful child's. And then the light from the setting sun fell on her face. And then insensibly, a strange change came over her. Her eyes grew suddenly dull and hard. Her breathing was heavy. The mouth opened and the pale gums drawn back made the teeth look large and sharp. Arthur? Oh, my love, I'm so glad you've come. Kiss me. Bend down and kiss me. Run for your life. Run for your living soul and hers. <laughs> Lucy! She's dead. Poor girl. There's peace for her at last. The end? Not so. It is only the beginning. Wait and see. Extra special, extra special, Kensington Horror, extra special. Westminster Gazette, September 25th. The Hampstead Mystery, the Kensington Horror, the Stabbing Woman, and the woman in black are vividly recalled to mind by a series of events that have taken place recently in the neighborhood of Hampstead. Several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or failing to return from playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children have given us their excuse that they have been with a beautiful lady who offered them chocolates in each case. The child was found to be slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wound seemed such as might be made by a rat or a small dog. Extra special, extra special.
Extra special, extra. The Hampstead Horror. Read all about it. Beautiful lady. Read all about the beautiful lady. Extra special. The Homestead Horror. Another child injured by the beautiful lady. We have just received intelligence that another child, missed last night, was only discovered late in the morning. It has the same tiny wound in the throat. Well, Suet, what do you think? You mean to tell me, my friend, that you still have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of? Nervous prostration following on great loss or waste of blood. And how was the blood lost or wasted? You are a clever man, my friend, and a good doctor. But you do not believe that there are things that you cannot understand. You are wrong. Seward, are you aware of all the mysteries of life and death? Can you tell me why in the pompous there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry those veins? Hmm? How on some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the trees all day and then when the sailors sleep on deck because it is hot, sweep down on them and in the morning I found dead men as white as Miss Lucy was. I understand none of these things. After tonight, Soot, if you dare to come with me, Perhaps then you will understand. September 29th, before dawn. Now it is done, and I would sooner die a thousand deaths than to live again what I did this night. We will spend the night, you and I, here in this churchyard where Miss Lucy is buried. We enter the tomb. And then? They open the coffin. You shall yet be convinced. Take care, Van Helsing. Miss Lucy is dead. Is it not so? Then there can be no wrong to her. But if she's not dead... With some difficulty, we found the Western Ratoon. I took up my place behind a yew tree on one side of the tomb, Van Helsing on the other. I was chilled and frightened. Suddenly I saw something moving between the two yew trees, a dim white figure which held something at its breast. The figure stopped. I could not see the face for it was bent down over what I saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a sharp little cry, such as when a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire in dreams. Then the thing saw us. She drew back with an angry snarl. Her lovely, blood-stained mouth grew to an open square. If ever a face meant death, I saw it at that moment. Then, suddenly, she turned and vanished in the direction of the tomb. The child is not harmed. Believe him in a safe place that the police find him. There's more to do. Come. Now, we're in the tomb. There, in the coffin, the thing lay like a nightmare of Lucy, the pointed teeth, a blood-stained mouth. Van Helsing never looked up. From his bag, he took out a book, his operating knives, a heavy hammer, and a round wooden stake, two or three inches thick, sharpened to a fine point and hardened over a fire. Seward, the life of this unhappy woman is just begun. Then she becomes what you call undead. There comes with the change the curse of immortality. She cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims, because all that die from the praying of the undead become themselves undead and prey on others. So the circle goes on, ever widening, as of the ripples from a stone drawn into the water. But... 
if this lady, the as undead, be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady, whom we love, shall be free again. Tell me, what am I to do? Take this stake in your left hand, the hammer in your right. Yes. Place the point over the heart. Yes. Then, then I begin to pray for the dead. In God's name, strike. Oh. Are you ready? Now, Domini, tose preste vede dele vive quo masmas tos dexculum tate patre. On the morning of July 11th, a man was found on the border of Transylvania. He talked wildly of wolves and boxes of earth and blood. He gave his name as Jonathan Harker. In a hospital at Clausenburg, he improved sufficiently to make possible his removal to England. I'm still quoting from my own personal papers, but then his condition remained so serious that he was committed for observation to a private ward in my hospital at Perfleet. Here, he did so well that in three weeks, he was completely recovered. It was during this time that his wife, Mina Harker, brought to the attention of Dr. Van Helsing and myself the journal that her husband had kept while the prisoner in the castle of a certain Count Dracula in Transylvania. I have before me the record of a meeting that took place in my study in Perfleet, transcribed by Mina Harker. October 1st. Meeting again, 10 after 8. Jonathan next to me, Dr. Seward afterwards, and Dr. Van Helsing at the head of the table. Oh, my friends, there are such things as vampires. Had I known at first what I know now, one so precious a life would have been spared for the many of us who love her. The vampire which is amongst us is himself so strong that he can direct all the elements, the storms, the fog, the thunder. He can command all the meaner things, the moth and bat, the owl, the fox, and the wolf. How then are we to begin our stride to destroy him? How shall we find this place? And having found it, how can we destroy? My friends, it is a terrible task that we undertake. To fail here is not mere life or death. If we fail, we become as him, foul things of the night, as him. What do you say? I answer for myself. Come near. I'm with you. The professor laid a small golden crucifix on the table. We took hands and our solemn pact was made. My friends, we too are not without strength. The vampire flourishes on the blood of the living. Without this, he cannot survive, he cannot live. He throws no shadow. He makes no reflection in the mirror. He can transform himself to the wolf, to bat. He can come back on moonlight rays as elemental dust. He can see in the dark. He can do all these things, yet he is not free. His power ceases at the coming of the day. Then until night, he must remain in the shape in which he finds himself, and except in his coffin home, in those earthly boxes, he cannot rest. When we can confine him in his coffin, then my friends, if we obey what we know, we will destroy him. At that moment, something flapped wildly against the window, then... Did you hit it? I don't know. We looked out the window. Against the black sky, you could see nothing. Data are now positioned. From the Count's castle in Transylvania to Whitby came 50 boxes of art. All of these, to our certain knowledge, were delivered at Carfax. Recently, 12 of these boxes have been removed. 
the step. Ascertain whether all the rest remain in the deserted house next door, or whether any more have been removed. We must break each of these boxes and sterilize the earth with holy water so he can no longer seek safety in them. And we must hurry. The events of the next few days are described in Jonathan Harker's journal. October 2nd, 5 a.m. Just returned from the empty house, left Mina here at home. Well, we've done our work at Carfax. The, the place was filthy, the air stagnant and foul, and alive with rats. We counted the boxes, only 38 of them. And over each one, the professor went through his same mysterious work. It was dawn when we got back. I, I found Mina asleep. She looked paler than usual. October 2nd. Soon after they left, I fell asleep. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs, and then it went silent. I got up and looked out the window. There was a thin streak of white mist moving across the grass along the wall of the house. It dawned on me that the air in the room was heavy and dank and cold. The gaslight came only like a tiny red spark in the fog. I could see through my eyelids. The mist grew thicker and thicker. Then as I looked, the spark divided and seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes. You shall be flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, blood of my blood. <gasps> October 2nd, 8 p.m. We are on the track. Twelve boxes were delivered to an empty house at 337 Piccadilly. My dear friends, until the sun sets tonight, Dracula must retain whatever form he now has. They have this day to hunt out all his lairs and sterilize them. Then he will have no place he can move and hide. But we only have until sunset. The house in Piccadilly was empty. Like the one at Purfleet, the same sickening smell was in the air. On the table, we found a clothes brush, a brush and a comb, and a basin, the latter containing dirty water which was reddened as if with blood. The boxes are back here. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. <sighs> Only eleven? Uh, there's a twelfth box somewhere. Gentlemen. It is after six. The sun is setting. We have no time to lose. He will return at any moment. Open the boxes. Quiet! Listen. Here it is. It is he. The window! You waste your bullets, gentlemen. You think you baffle me? You with your pale faces all in a row like sheep in a butcher's. You think you have left me without a place to rest. But I have more. And time is on my side. The one you love is mine already. I have known her. Already my mark is on her throat. Flesh of my flesh. Blood of my blood. She is with me always, over land or sea. October 4th, morning. Another meeting in the study at Purfleet. We must find that remaining box, gentlemen. We must find it. As long as that earth exists and pure. As long as there remains one place of refuge for Dracula. There is no safety and no peace for any soul in England. And for the undead, never peace so long as he lives. Blood of my blood, blood of my blood. Mina! How do you know that? Quiet, quiet. With me, with me always, over land and sea. Mina, darling, how did you know that Dracula said those? I don't know. The words just came. 
strange. There are times when somehow I feel that I'm with him. At sunset? Yes, just at sunset and again at sunrise. Dr. Van Helsing, if I could, if at that time you... Have you the courage? The, the courage for what? What do you mean? Dr. Van Helsing here will question me. I've questioned her, yes. In a state of hypnosis, the one you love is already mine, he said. She is with me always, over land or sea. Ah, Count Dracula, perhaps she will betray you if she really is with you. The one you love, who knows if she is really with you over land or sea. Blood of my blood. Nina. Yes. Answer me, Nina. Are you with him? Yes, I am with him. Where are you? I do not know. It is all dark. What do you hear? The lapping of water. I can hear it on the outside. Then you are on a ship? Yes. What else do you hear? There is the creaking of an anchor chain. What are you doing? Still. Oh, so still. It is like death. It is like death. Here is a report from the Matson Peabody, shipbrokers, dated October 5th. According to Lloyd's lists, the only sailing ship that left the Black Sea yesterday, with the Serena Katrina bound for Varna, somehow before she sailed, a man came alongside, all in black, driving a cart with a great box in it. This he lifted down single-handed and carried below. No one remembers having seen him after that, as a heavy mist came up over Doolittle Dock until sailing time. The rest of London Harbour remained completely clear. Our plans are made. The average sailing time from London to the Black Sea is three weeks. We can travel over land to the same place in three days. We shall be there waiting for him when he arrives. October 15th. Arrived, Varna, about five o'clock. Mina seems stronger. Every morning before sunrise and just before sunset, she speaks to Van Helsing in a trance. Are you with me, Mina? Tell me, are you with him? I'm with him. What can you see? Nothing. All is dark. What can you hear? I can hear the, the waves lapping against the ship and the water brushing by. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds, and the bow throws back the foam. So the Tsarina Katrina is still at sea, hastily to Varna. The Count cannot cross running water, so he cannot leave the ship without being observed. What do you hear, Mina? Lapping waves, rushing water, darkness. Darkness and wind. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams from Lloyd's. Not yet reported. 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 Lapping waves. Rushing water. Rushing water. Creeping mass. Darkness, darkness and wind. October 24th, telegram. Lloyds, London to Harker. Serena Katrina reported this morning from Dardanelle. Lloyds, London to Harker, October 28th. Tsarina Katrina in heavy fog reported entering Galatz Harbor at one o'clock today. Galatz. Golotz is 38 hours from here, and the first train for Golotz leaves at 6.30 tomorrow morning. My friends, 
we have lost. I'm with you. I can see nothing. Nothing. I can hear men's voices calling in the roar and the creak of the wind. I can feel the air blowing upon us. October 29th, evening. We are due between two and three in the morning, but already at Bucharest, we are three hours late. Something's going on. I feel it pass me like a cold wind. I can hear far off confused sounds. Men talking in strange tongues. Fierce, falling water and the howling of the wolves. There's another sound. How queer a sound, like, like. Like what? Speak, Mina, speak, I command you. I command you to speak. Arrived in Galatz, saw the captain of the Serena Katrina. Come on, come aboard. We're over an hour before the sun up. We receive a box for a party by the name of Dracula. Had his papers all right. Emmanuel Heindelschen, his name was. Mr. Hildesheim? Yes? You unloaded a box yesterday. I give it to Koilov by order. Koilov. Mr. Koilov? Hello. This morning they find him dead inside a churchyard in St. Peter. They find him dead with his throat torn open. October 30th, evening. There are two ways in which Dracula can get back to his own place, by land or by water. We've examined the map and find the most likely river is the Sereth. You and I, Seward, will charter steam launch and follow him up the river. Uh, Van Helsing and Mina will take a train to Veresti, uh, and from there... We, we... From there, we shall go into the track where Harker went to B Streets over to Borgo. If you have not caught him before... We shall be meeting Dracula there. October 31st. We arrived at Veresti at noon. Van Helsing and I brought the carriage here. We start in an hour. Our enemy is still on the river. October 31st. We can earn good speed up the river at night. There's plenty of water and the banks are wide apart. November 1st, evening. No news all day. We hear that a big boat went up the river before us, going at more than usual speed. November 4th, all day driving. The country gets wilder as we go by. By morning, we should reach the Borgo Parks. November the 4th, evening. We've left the launch. We've got horses and we follow on the track along the river. We are armed. Look, quick! There they are now, heading west. Uh, Through the dawn, we could see the Slovaks some miles before us, dashing along the river with their wagon. On it is the great box. Late in the afternoon, we leave the Borgo Pass. Van Helsing, look, look. We could see a long way all around, far off beyond the white waste of snow, like a black ribbon curling. Between us on the river, not far off, came a group of men, mounted Slovaks hurrying along. In the midst of them was a wagon that swept from side to side. On the wagon was a great box. Look! We see two horses following fast, coming up from the south. Suet and Haka, the Slovaks with their heavy wagon, are losing the ground. Now the horses are not more than a mile behind. Now the wagon is quite close. We can see the great box swaying bravely. Now they are almost upon us. Now has happened a strange thing. The wagon smashed into a great rock buried in the snow, lost its front wheels and turned over on its side, jammed against the stone. 
The horses tore loose from their traces and bolted, and the Slovaks scattered and vanished after them. Then silence. Silence like comes after, ringing a bell. Look, his face. It is Dracula, sprawled out stiff and twisted in the smear of his own holy earth. The box, in falling, has emptied the dirt onto the snow. His face is old looking. The skin is like paper. Dr. Seward, there is no time. Look at the sun. Sunset. In one minute it is sunset and he is forever lost to us. Have you the stake of wood and the hammer? Yes. Now, Seward, pray for us. Kneel down and pray. Harker, the stake of wood over his heart. Be not afraid, Harker. Do not look into his eyes. The hammer, now Harker, strike, strike. Flesh, flesh of my flesh, guilt of my guilt, death of my death. Speak and be manifest in the instant of your master's peril. Elements of darkness, rain, evil wind, mist and mold and tempest. Strike! The others couldn't, but somehow I can hear him speaking behind his eyes. Claw, wing, tooth, scale, tissue of flesh, death of my death. Dead and undead, the hand of the living is over your master. Console me, my children. This instant is no longer than the space between two heartbeats. But the light is not here, and I am lonely. Come to your master, my children. Beguile him now, in the instant of his peril. Beguile him with the sound of your names. Claw. Wing, tooth, scale, tissue of flesh, claw, wing, tooth, scale, tissue of flesh. Strike, Harker, strike! There is one very dear to me who has not answered. My love, Mina. There is less than a minute between me and the night. You must speak for me. You must speak with my heart. Give them to me, Jonathan. Give them to me. The stick and the wood and the hammer. Harker! I shall never forget that moment. The look on poor Mina's face as she stood there, the angry scar standing out on her throat, her, her eyes like living coals in the last red of the sunset. She had torn the stake and the hammer out of my hands with the strength of an animal. Mina, do you know what you have done, woman? Do you know what you have done to us? You have released him. The evil is free. Look! The sun! As we look down at Dracula, and the yes saw the sinking sun, and the hate in them turned to triumph. Flesh of my flesh, come to me, my love. Come into the night and the darkness. You have served me well, my love, my bride, my... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, all the evidence is now before you. I've added nothing, and to the best of my knowledge, I have omitted nothing that might help to throw light upon the extraordinary events of the year 1891, which culminated on that terrible evening in the Borgo Pass. There remains only this last one report. Vimina Harker seized the stake and hammer from her husband. I believe she was under some form of hypnosis. She herself remembers nothing. But whatever influence was at work on her, she must, at the last moment, have rejected it. For at the exact instant the sun disappeared, it was Mina Harker who drove the stake through the heart of the thing that called itself Dracula. At that same instant, even as we looked, the wound on the side of her throat was no more. As for Dracula, before the screams of the creature had died from our ears, 
the whole body, crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. In the final moment of the solution, there was in the face a look of peace such as I could have never imagined might have rested there. Tonight's production of Dracula by the Mindstream players in which this brilliant group will bring to life a series of great narratives, all presented in the immediacy of the first person singular. Uh, it's all right. You can rest easy. It's just a sound effect. I mean, there, over there in the shadows, see? Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. I think it's nothing. But always remember, Ladies and gentlemen, there are wolves, there are vampires. Such things do exist. This is the Mindstream Players. This week, the Mindstream. <laughs> I'm gonna get it this time. Hopeless, hopeless. Uh, who has a stake? Yes. This week, the mind. <clears throat> I just had puberty. You get puberty. This week, the Mindstream players was proud to have Jude Prest, Vernon G. Wells, Pete Handelman, Teresa Ireland, and Tanya Johnson, with myself, Curtis Bedford, and Tom Conkle. Also, uh, sound design this week by Vince. Colavidi. <laughs>